They'll be traveling back home tonight, so be mindful of that uh, through the day and pray for them. We, um, there's a report on Brother Bud. I don't, I don't have it in front of me um, today. I think they've increased his oxygen level to 100%, so he's not doing very well at all. Um, in fact, uh, we're going to paw, we're going to stop what we're doing today at about 11 o'clock and have a special prayer for Brother Bud. Um, and that's going to be a body-wide prayer, special prayer for him. We, this is quite a time that we find ourselves with the ministry um, being pushed um, in some ways to take measures that they're not accustomed to with the lockdowns and the quarantines. <clears throat> and then even in addition to that, where we have the risk now of losing great men suddenly. We've experienced that before in different times in the body when men have passed away, even in this assembly when Brother Linegar passed away quite rapidly and unexpectedly. Um, but we're at risk here, of course, with this coronavirus and how it impacts the elderly and the older uh, members of our assemblies that it we're at risk of not only losing one man of God, we potentially could lose multiples, along with our saints and piano players and so forth. So again, as just a, a cautionary, I, I want to encourage all of you to make sure that you maintain your social distancing measures that you put in practice, that we don't lose our um, standard that we've implemented here. Uh, refrain from touch and so forth. Um, we want to protect everyone that we can. And we love all y'all, and we don't want to lose anybody. Um, so if you would, please take that to heart and keep it in consideration. We're really blessed here in this assembly to, to have what we have, to have each other. And <clears throat> I'm reminded of different ones that have been in quarantine or locked into their facilities. You know, for example, my mother, she's, she's locked in. Um, she has been, and, and she's not the only one. Every resident in that nursing home was essentially isolated in their room for months, several months. You know, in many ways, that feels like a jail or a prison cell for a lot of people. But even beyond that, just in cities and in communities around this country, there's been a lot of people that have experienced the same thing. And it's, they've been isolated in their apartments and their homes, away from their families. Uh, Gladys and I and, and our daughters were able to go to Tyler yesterday to visit uh, my in-laws. We haven't seen them since this all started. And so we spent, were able to spend a few hours with them. Didn't you know, it felt unusual for me to sit in their home with a mask on, um, but I did because it's the right thing to do. You know, there's no point in taking unnecessary risks. Not to debate, you know, the scientific aspects of any of it. I'm not particularly interested in talking about that. What I am interested, though, in talking about is, is I want to encourage you today to know that temptation and, and trials and tests are part of our process. Uh, in fact, um, they're necessary. And if we will, let's, I'd like to turn over to the first chapter of James. And uh, I want to go through a few scriptures. I appreciate your consideration today. Um, and uh, let's see if we can dig into the Word of God and, and draw some courage and uh, wisdom through the Word of God today. In the first chapter of James, the very first verse, says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So the very first inference here is that James is talking to somebody who's mature. He's talking to a group of people that have served God for a long time. 
<coughs> they're not <coughs> they're not <coughs> excuse me <coughs> they're not the kind of people that are are babes in Christ they're people that have, are familiar with the word of God they're familiar with God's order he said, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Of course, you all may remember my talk on patience. Um, I got inspired to, to flush out some scriptures on patience uh, there at the first of the year. And uh, we often mock patience. We, we ridicule, you know, we, we, I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but we, we take light sometimes. Oh, don't pray for patience because tribulation works patience, you know, and you don't want that. And you know how we are. We, we kind of shun at times from the burdens and responsibilities that come with being a child of God. And it's natural for us to do that because it hurts. We're having to change from our way to the Lord's way. And that's not natural for us. And it, it makes us uncomfortable. You know, it, it lights a little fire under us. And, and you know, it, it, it can be intimidating. I can look around this room and, and, and you could look around this room and we could all appreciate the fact that change does not come easy. In fact, even the slightest change will make some of us very uncomfortable. In fact, me being your Bible uh, uh, teacher today may make some uncomfortable just from the simple fact that there's change, just a little bit of change. And so there's a, the value of patience um, is fantastic. Because it allows you to endure things that you never thought you were possible. That you would never have expected yourself to be able to tolerate. He said in the fifth verse, he said, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven from the wind and tossed. Notice this next two verses. Read them together. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We've all seen, you know, somebody said, I'm a man halted between two opinions. We've seen that little image. We call them memes now. I used to. They were just kind of an image or a cartoon of a little boy coming to a crossroad and holding two uh, cow's tails, you know, and one was going one way and one was going the other. He was halted between two opinions. And, and truly, that's where we are. We find ourselves on a daily basis halted between two opinions, the opinion of our will and the opinion of God's will. And, you know, it's a quest. It's a challenge for us to pursue the Lord's will in our lives and not be uh, not deny him his rightful place but in that it's not easy and no one should operate under the illusion that serving God is a cakewalk because it's simply not and you know you may recall my background as Baptist and one of the biggest you know elements of the Baptist uh, faith is once saved always saved and while there's you know a measure of truth in that that I respect it still requires a daily death Paul said I die daily and so there's a requirement on all of us to be willing to experience the sting of death I was listening to the Word of God yesterday on my way home and I thought about the sting of death uh, you know, the writer said, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Well, when you overcome, there is no more sting. There's no more kick. There's no more fight. When you reach perfection, you're no longer experiencing that kickback of Adam and the carnal mind. You're, in fact, you're, you're walking on a higher ground. 
And so let us not be double-minded in our purpose because a double-minded man is unstable in all, in all his ways. In the ninth verse, he said, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as a flower of the, of the grass he shall pass away. If I have time today, I want to mention a few things about leadership. And in particular, one of the greatest things about leadership is the fact that leadership requires someone who's exa- who's, who is high to become low. I, I've told this before and I'll tell it again. I hope you'll receive it uh, in a way that doesn't um, intimidate you or offend. But I came home from work one day and, and things weren't like they should in my household and it bothered me. Um, and I don't mean this to make light of my wife or my children. Uh, but this is how things are. You know, there's order in everything we do. Whether it's in your home, in your, in your, on your job, in your school, there's always order. And it's when we break that order is when problems occur. And, if, and never more so, uh, uh, to deviate just slightly, never more so than what we witness in the city of Minneapolis. They, they deviated from order, they have anarchy, they burned their city, they burned city blocks down. And now the school teachers and the principals are struggling because they don't have order in their schools. Their children are out of order. The whole, the, everything's out of order because order was allowed to be broken to begin with. And so we don't like it. We don't always like, you know, we don't like oppression. No one, no one here should like oppression. No one's advocating oppression. I'm not, certainly. However, at the same time, without law and order, then almost certainly somebody's going to be oppressed. In fact, the rise of domestic violence in this nation is terrible. And, it, and that is oppression. And if you've never been in a home with domestic violence, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you have, you know very well what I'm talking about. Domestic violence is absolutely oppression. So anyway, the, a leader is required to submit to order the same as someone of low degree. I came home that day, I started to say, and things weren't like they should, and I started correcting them. And uh, everybody in the house, I mean from little Neth on up. Everybody in the house got mad at me. I was like, hold on. I've been gone all day long. I said, and you know where I've been? I've been at work. And you know what they've been doing at work? Bossing me around. I get bossed all day long. If you work the job, you know what I'm talking about. I said, and hey, the man I work for, I said, y'all know my boss. He owns a company. He's the owner of the company. He's not sitting around with his feet up on the desk all day long. You know what he's doing? He's on the phone. And you know what's happening? The customers are bossing him around all day long. I said, so here's, here's my boss, and here's me, and here's your mama, and here's you, know, you children. And you're getting mad because you're getting bossed by me at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I've been bossed all day long. There's order. But it all requires humility. And through that order and through that humility, we can work together and get a lot accomplished. He said in the 11th verse, For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat but withereth the grass, and the flower thereof fadeth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. And that's true. I've met one time, he happened to be the richest man in the world, Sam Walton. He used to deliver his paper when I was a little kid. Fine, he was a fine man. He was easy to, to greet, know you by name, if you got to know him, you know, too many times. His memories faded away. 
Most people don't even know who he is. They don't have a clue what he did, how brilliant he was to establish a retail environment that, that changed America. There's, there's a fading away, just like the grass. He said, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil. The, the idea that God is not going to try you is, is misleading. He's not going to tempt you with evil. You know why God can't be tempted with evil? Who's going to accuse him? Who's going to say, oh, God, you're wrong? No. He makes the law. Therefore, he, there's, whatever he does is always right. You know, that's a hard thing to comprehend, and it's really difficult to establish in our mind that whatever God does is always right. Even when he flooded the earth and destroyed almost all of humanity, it was right. That is the essence of faith, my friends, and in, in, even in this circumstance where we find ourselves with this coronavirus, with the lockdowns, the, the, cir the, the desperation that ensues, the, even the deaths that we've experienced. God has not shielded us from that. Can you imagine being the children of Israel and living in Egypt, being surrounded by plagues on a daily basis? I mean, it wasn't just one coronavirus. It was day after day. God brought his people to their knees, and I assure you, he will do the same to us. He, even if we're low or high, we are going to have to find a place in our life where we are humble in how we approach him in his business, because what he does is always right. And the temptation there is, the test and the trial is experienced because it's conflicting with us, our will, versus his will. I'll never forget, I will never forget this, when we decided to move to Little Rock. It was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made in my life. I, and I know that some of you probably will relate to that. And my mother, bless her heart, asked me, she said, why do you want to move down there? I said, Mom, I really don't. But I feel like it's God's will. And I can't have it any, I can't afford to have it any other way. He said, but every man is tempted in the 14th verse when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So we know that the wages of sin is death. That's not a mystery to us, thankfully. You know, we're a dead man walking, honestly. If we're, if we're caught in the wages of sin, the penalty is death. He said... Uh, do not err, my beloved brother. And I want to remind you that these are men and women. These, these 12 tribes are experienced in serving God. Did you know that even experienced Christians, aged Christians, still need to be reminded and encouraged? They need to be uplifted in the Word of God and the things in the path of righteousness. He said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Wow. And cometh down from the Father of lights with whom, we have, with whom is no variableness. Now, again, everything that God does is right. There is no shadow of turning with him. Everything that he does is always right. He said, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Wherefore of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. He said, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. The word superfluity there means excessive. Lay it, all, lay it aside. Lay it all 
all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. And of course we know that's talking about a mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? You know, how many times do you look in a mirror on, on a, you know, in, a, in the course of a day? Are, are you pleased? You know, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for me to look in a mirror, honestly, because I don't see the man I feel like I am inside. I see kind of a stranger. In fact, I'm, Brother Caleb... I got my hair cut the other day, and, my, and the first thing my wife said to me, she said, oh, it's so silver. Like, what? Oh, I like it, she says. That's all that matters, isn't it? I don't see the man I feel like on the inside. But he said, this man, he's like a man who beholds himself in a glass. Let's see. In the 21st verse, he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. There's an old song, um, roll back the curtain, the memory now and then. Remind me, dear Lord. You know, it, it, it's not pretty when I'm reminded of who I was. And honestly, it's not pretty of when I'm reminded of what I could be. There's another song. It says, For the grace of God, there goes me. I'm thankful today. I'm thankful that the Lord has laid His hand upon me and changed my life. And I know if you all were... I mean, we've been working here in Little Rock and, and worshiping with you all for uh, 19 years, going on 19 years. And... I'm sure that there's probably, if you rolled back a few memories about me and my family, there, you'd probably think, oh, I remember when Brother Painter did this or said that or, you know, whatever the case was. You know, we, we all try to, to forget. We try to put that in the past and move forward. And, and in fact, I think it's important. If you're not looking to the future, you're not making progress. There's a, an old saying that says, I'm not down, I'm either up or getting up. I have no desire. I can't undo the past. There, I, I don't have a time machine. I don't have that kind of capability. I don't have any magical power to go take back a word. But what did he say? Be slow to, slow to speak, slow to wrath. By implementing those kind of measures, it allows me to prevent from saying something stupid all the time instead of just every now and then. <laughs> He said, he said, but whosoever looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, there's an emphasis there, continueth, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, isn't that a challenge? To be unspotted from the world, to, to be in the world but not of the world. What a, what a time we live in. There's so much information. There's so many things that are presented to us just, just like that. I mean, it's just we're overwhelmed with data and knowledge and information to the point where we don't even know how to process it's, it's almost to the point where if you don't unplug, you have just a, a fog of information, just a cloud of information that you can't even process. You won't, you'll find yourself not even taking care of the business at hand. Do you know that happens? I'm working on, we're designing a new product right now, and anytime you design new products, you have prototypes. And uh, a prototype is not a production model. In fact, there's a lot of prototypes that go into play before you go into production. And my first job with Walmart was uh, 
was 17, 16, uh, going on 17, and I served the merchandising division, specifically the buyers. And I'd go, they would sit down and they'd meet with their, the prospective vendor and the vendor would have his product. Say if he's selling microphones, he'd have his microphones there and he'd be describing how great it was. And Walmart always required the vendors to leave samples behind. And so my job was to go in after those buyers meetings and gather up all those samples and, and clean the room, straighten the chairs and, and things like that. And it was, it was a great opportunity for me. It's the first time I ever saw a grown man in a business suit cry. And it, it made me sad. Uh, the, he was a vendor, and the, the Walmart buyer just destroyed him. I mean, that guy was tears from the time he got there to the time he left. It was unbelievable. i never seen anything like that. But the, there was always samples. There was always prototypes. And so even like now, I'm dealing with a prototype. And nothing's, nothing's right the first time. I mean, other than, you know, when I met Gladys and it was love at first sight. So I had that going for me. But this proto, these prototypes weren't right. And, and so I'm working with a young man, and he's not experienced enough in dealing with stuff like that. And he's all frustrated because nothing's connecting together, nothing's matching up. You know, you got... It's like that old Johnny Cash song where he got it one piece at a time. You know, he's got a tail fin on his Cadillac from a 65 and another from a 67. He's got a headlight from 71 and another headlight from 72. And it just, you know, it, nothing was adding up, Brother Daniels, and he was all kinds of frustrated. But I wasn't. Because nothing's perfect to begin with except for what the Lord made. He made heaven and earth. He made Adam perfect. Adam fell and left us in a bad state. Saints of God, don't be dis discouraged, but at the same time, endure your temptations, your trials, your tests. <laughs> he said to be unspotted from the world. Now, it's interesting. So here you have James, Apostle James, working on this. Let's go over, if you will, turn with me to First Peter in the first cha uh, fourth chapter. just want to bring emphasis to you on how important it is to bravely face your challenges. There's a sting when things aren't going your way. That sting is natural. That frustration that you experience when you fail that test or, you, or when that that lesson that you're trying to accomplish, that essay that you're having to write, it's taking a long time. It's, it's getting into your, your fun time. Those things are necessary. Even we passed the dog park. We always pass the dog park on 630. And I told my wife, I said, I can hardly imagine somebody being faithful to take their dog to a dog park and not being faithful to, to take themselves to church. How ridiculous. How ridiculous this society is that they put so much focus on nothingness and they, they are afraid to be challenged in changing their own lives. They hide. Saints of God, be of good courage today and face your challenges. Yes, there's going to be a sting, but it's necessary. 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, and the twelfth verse, he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Gladys and I, when we were traveling yesterday, we got to talking about... Uh, some differences between happiness and joy. And uh, I haven't done a word study on joy, but there's quite a few different words in the Greek and the Hebrew that were interpreted as joy. Um, so it's a little bit, 
it's a little confused, confusing to an extent when you start reading joy and uh, about joy and trying to understand what the writer was implying. But one thing that that um, I, I am convinced of is happiness naturally is it's almost like an emotional response, and, it, and it's great. You know, the Bible says, merry heart doth work like a medicine, right? So we all need to have a measure of happiness, a, a, a satisfaction, if you will, a, a smile on your face. In fact, if you don't have a smile today, find one of these, uh, maintain your social distancing, of course, but find one of these young kids around here, say, have you got a smile you can share with me? Because they might. They might just take it right off their face and give it to you. You know, what's that old song? Smile a while and give your face a rest. But joy, finding joy comes with having a satisfaction or a, a confidence that what you're doing is genuine, that it is purposeful. It is, it, it is rewarding beyond just a momentary feeling. Waking up with joy in the morning and knowing that you're in the hands of the Almighty God, that is yours to possess. When you come through that test, when you walk through that valley, when you cross that mountain, when you know that you and the Lord have have accomplished something, then you can have joy and no one can take that away. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Nothing can, can take that away. When you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you experience a joy that is undeniable. You can't, I mean, even in your worst times when you feel like the world's coming to an end, you still know with confidence that the Lord reached down His hand and put a satisfaction, a happiness, a, a life-changing, joyful moment that nothing can deny that. Now, you can turn your back on it. And I understand what it means to be a reprobate and all those things. But I'm not talking about that today. What I'm talking about is a Christian like these men are talking about. Experienced people. This is, we read it from James. We're reading here from Peter. He said, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers. Uh, let's see, that ye may be also with the, glad with exceeding joy. In the 14th verse, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the Spirit of of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Hallelujah. They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So that's Peter. He's driving that message home. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Yes, it stings. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it doesn't. It makes you feel uncomfortable, but it's not strange. It's strange for the ungodly, but that's not who we are. And that's not who he's talking about. And that's not who uh, John was talking to. Now, if you will, let's turn over to the fifth chapter of Romans. Now we're moving over to another apostle. Uh, apostle Paul. In the fifth chapter of Romans, he said... Uh, In the first verse, he said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. All of your hope is in the Lord. All of it. He said, Not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope. Now notice there in that second verse, he said, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then in this fourth verse, he says, experience works hope. For you to understand the glory of God, you have to learn patience. You have to go through experiences. You have to, to, uh, under, you have to go through tribulations. And then he said in the fifth verse, he said, and hope maketh not ashamed, not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. 
Isn't it amazing that you can learn tribulation, you can learn love, you can learn hope, you can gain experience and patience through tribulation. You think, well, that's strange. Well, is it really? You take a child, which all of us were, and how did you learn? You learn through teaching, you learn through correction, you learn through experience, you learn through patience, you even learn through hope. One of the greatest things, we grew up poor and worked hard, uh, always had a garden or we were always working, selling wood or we always had something. My, my mother told everybody that she kept me working to keep me out of jail. Um, and I don't know if she got that from God or God got it from her because I'm still working all the time. <laughs> But, but one of the nicest things that I remember growing up, Brother Daniels, after we'd spend all day in the garden, pulling weeds, planting this, working on that, is a root beer float. Oh, brother. A little, couple scoops of ice cream, a little bit of root beer. That felt pretty good on a Saturday afternoon. Root beer float. You know what I had? On Saturday morning, I had hope. I had hope I was going to get one, maybe two, if I could talk my way into it. <laughs> I had hope. Did you know that you can have, you may be going through a trial and a test right now, and I assure you, the body of Christ is, our pastor is, uh, especially. We have hope, as the writer said, not only in this life, but in the life to come. What a privilege it is to be a child of the Most High God. And so here Paul, he's saying, Hope maketh not ashamed, for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given, to un given unto us. I want to, I'll wrap up here in Hebrews, the fourth chapter just to bring home a little bit strong, uh, reinforce that the Apostle Paul was, was driving that message home. In, the, uh, in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, in the, in, uh, the twelfth verse, he said, the word of God is quick and powerful. Isn't it so? sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Boy, don't you feel that sting when you start reading the Word of God and you start learning, do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And then you see that you're guilty of those things when it says don't do that. They asked this little boy, he was always into something, and somebody come along and said, what's your name, boy, son? He said, my name's don't do that. <laughs> Guilty. I feel that way sometimes. I'm like, oh, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't type that. Delete that. <laughs> Shut your mouth. He said in the 13th verse, he said, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You're not hid, saints of God. God sees all. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, your testimony, your profession, the day that you said, yes, Lord, I will serve you. Let us hold fast to that. He said, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. Boldly. Let's have courage. Say, well, this... This, this school year's hard. That's all right. 
Face it. My job is hard. That's all right. Face it. This relationship that I'm trying to work through is, is driving me crazy. It's all right. Face it. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they first agree? Agree to what? Walk together. Face it. Let's come boldly before God. You say, well, this, this medical condition I'm dealing with is hard. That's okay. Face it. We're not down, saints of God. We may feel like we're down, but we're not down. We're either up or we're getting up. Let, let's let courage fill our hearts, even in the midst of, of sorrow, in the midst of death, the midst of frustration. Let's be courageous. He said, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help. What, when? In the time of need. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to have prayer upstairs at 11 o'clock. Uh, actually, we're going to... Uh, we might as well go upstairs and have prayer at 11 o'clock. So we'll be dismissed here. And um, we're going to pray. If you all want to go ahead and be dismissed, I'll keep talking just slightly. We're going to pray for brother and sister... For brother Bud today. And ask God to lift him up. They need a miracle. They're facing some major decisions. And if so if y'all start making your way upstairs so we can have prayer up there at 11 o'clock. And glory, thank you for your attention today.